kill men. Seven men. I'm 27 years old. I've killed seven men. I'm telling you what I saw. I saw murder up on that heart, and I didn't appreciate it. I was a revolutionist and terrorist, a gun runner, a hitman. San Quentin Prison was built in 1852, and ironically, it's located in one of the most affluent areas in the country, Marin County, California. It has the most remarkable history of violence of any American institution. One cell block is popularly known to inmates as Little Vietnam, a particular outdoor passageway as Death Alley. The latrines as OK Corral. Prisoners in other institutions call Quentin the arena. Every year, dozens of men are involved in stabbing incidents, many resulting in death. There's no place to run from a threat or an enemy, or from those whose tension Fear and paranoia have become a way of life. Just spit some tobacco juice down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, sit down. Come on, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? Hey, man. Hi, Mom. Merry Christmas, Mom. Don't worry about your kid. He's all right. <laughs> There's an entirely different value system at San Quentin. The inmates feel that it's okay to kill someone under certain circumstances, such as if that person has killed a friend of yours or a member of your gang, or if that person owes you a debt. You're supposed to retaliate by killing that person. Man, uh, these bulls, they shot me. Uh, this dude, he didn't even fire no warning shot, you know, and he just shot me out in the yard, and uh, you see the bullet come out about an inch under my heart. Dude was trying to kill me, you know? Don't nobody know how it is in here, you know? Otherwise, you can talk to them all day and never understand, you know? But I understand, I know everything. I've been to all the max security holes. I've been, I've been to AC, 4A, I've been to B section. I've been, every max security hole they've been, I've been there. And you know what, I haven't seen a change yet in prison. All I've seen it get worse and worse and worse. I watch it every day. This is my world. I grew up in it. I know it inside out. I know what to expect. Um, it's my frame of reference. You've lived on the streets. Um, when you walk out of your house in the morning, you make automatic decisions that uh, you don't think about, whether you're going to go on a bus or what you're going to do as far as change goes. and uh, uh, Even the minor purchases and things that you make through the day and your constantly facing people that wear different types of clothing, that have different points of view. Um, you live in a, a very competitive manner uh, in some ways in the fact that you're always ready to defend your own view and you don't even think about these things. In here, when I walk across the yard among 2,500 men, I see nothing but people in blue. In general, I know where their heads are at. I know um, pretty much what their stories are going to be after I talk to them for three or four minutes. And it's a, it's a life that I'm as at home with as you are with your life on the streets. For me out there, um, it's a constant pressure to uh, at least give the appearance of conforming and I don't understand the streets. Um, I got physically ill the first time I faced a crowd after I come off the road. Uh, I couldn't handle it. There's too many different people, too many different views. I know a lot of guys that are, they, don't, they won't talk about it that much, but they don't want to hit the streets, you know I mean? Uh, they've never made it on the streets. They don't know how to make it on the streets. They go out for a vacation, but they know when they go out, they're coming back. You just get pushed so much, just at one time, it blows everybody's bomb. They just they, they just don't care, don't care about the guns, don't care about nothing, just blow it. What were you doing before you became a guard? I was a logger. What? A logger in Idaho. How, what, what made you decide to become a guard? Oh, I wanted to get in law enforcement, and uh, my father works up at Susanville, penitentiary up there, and uh, through the steps, you know. Like father, like son. <laughs> I like it real well. 
I guess what I like about it is it's not monotonous. There's something different every day. I've never had the same kind of a day twice. I don't believe I've ever had a day that I've worked uh, for the department that I disliked. I like my job real well. I like the men I work with. There are two types of guards at Quentin. One man's the guard towers and entrances. The other is referred to as special security or goon squad. This SWAT-like team is constantly searching for weapons which can be made of almost anything. The wires from a bucket or bed spring, a stake bone, a light fixture, or even a window handle. Frustrated and restless, prisoners sometimes set mattresses on fire and then throw them off their tier. The exercise yard serves a very important purpose. Lifting weights helps the men to work out their aggressions and pent up hostility. Unfortunately, the convicts with high violence potential are allowed only one hour per week in the yard. I've been here at San Quentin now for six months. I'm here for what is called multiple murder, two murders. I'm also here for robbery, and I have three special circumstances allegations. One which is robbery murder, the other one which is supposed killing of a witness, and the third is for the uh, two or more is mass murder. Each one of these separate special circumstances merit the death penalty. I was born and raised in San Francisco lived in the Mission District of San Francisco, which is the middle-income area. I wasn't married, I was still living with my parents. And uh, just uh, sort of Mr. Inconspicuous. I was never involved in any kind of crime. This is the first time I've ever been arrested. No prior juvenile record. So this is a completely brand new experience. And uh, I always, it's sort of ironic now when I look back, being that I was a member of the Republican Party on the odd side, that I voted for the death penalty myself when it was on the ballot. If a man's gonna rehabilitate or repent or change his way, it definitely don't take no 13 or 14 years to do it. Don't do nothing but embittering. You got a three-year date after doing ten years. Right. How, how, when, when did you get that three-year date? March, March of this year. And see, uh, I've been employable in this trade here, I guess, for about 14 months now. You see, and it seemed kind of useless to me, you know, a, use, a waste of state money for a guy to uh, be employable in this trade and uh, still have the amount of time in that I have, yet not, you know, they won't let you go to uh, utilize the skill that you've learned here, yeah. you see, in a productive, more productive sense. You know, this is supposed to be the whole purpose of this show, is to make you a more useful citizen and so forth when you get back to the community. you get paid for doing this here in prison? No. You don't get paid at all? No, well, they have what they call uh, three pay numbers in here. The lead man, which is uh, Bug Lattimore, he gets paid. The guy that works the uh, slices get paid, and the guy who works the freezer get paid. I think they make $10 a month. Do you have any contacts with the outside world? Oh, I get visits uh, maybe every three weeks, maybe once a month. I don't really like them you know, so close together, because you run out of things to talk about. This reflects the attitude of many inmates who feel that contact with people on the outside can be frustrating and a cause of depression. Couples talk, sitting at tables, but are allowed to embrace for a few minutes at the end of the visit. A guard is always nearby. It's just, uh, just crazy people. Son, I'm predictable out there. You don't want to get those babysitters or the only ones you want to get that taste for your kids is someone you really know. Your mom's, like guess, the best person you can, you can trust with your kids. Jolly. Dolly. She calls her her Dolly. Oh, yeah. 
There's no hiding the facts. The facts is evident. It's in the papers every day about how this death trap and the parole system and the adult authority. Here's one man sitting behind the desk. He's about ready to die in five years and he's gonna tell you, you got to do eight. They bring these kids back here for what? He's a dope fiend. If he's a dope fiend, take him to the hospital, detox him. That's what we got methadone out there for. Don't bring him back in this penitentiary. Let one of these kids get out of line and see what they do to him. We'll send him back up to that trap up there, what we call on the front. The Delta thought is above the law in this state. It answers to no one. I don't care if the uh, California Supreme Court says something. They got purit, law, love. Uh, uh, Fury, all those cases on there. It tells the Delta Authority about its, uh, its power, its administrative power. But it's above the legislature, it's above the executive, and it's above the judiciary. It has no one to answer to. It's all power, sir. It's all power, sir. The man's name was uh, Pierce, and uh, he uh, got pieces of a broken light bulb from a light fixture that was in the cell, uh, just adjacent to the gas chamber, and slashed his throat with a piece of it and uh, nicked his jugular vein. And as the blood was spurting out, of course, the doctor said that uh, we're going to have to hurry up or he'll beat the state. Of course, you can't advance the time fixed by the court for an execution, but they did hurry the process of getting the man seated in the chair and strapped down, and uh, then had the door dogged and everything ready to go. And in the process of hurriedly strapping him in, one of his arms worked loose and flailed around, and as the blood was spurting from his throat, it hit his hand and his wrist, and splattered all over the interior of the chamber and the witnesses outside were fainting faster than the officers who are normally posted there to catch the one or two people who might fall uh, could even make a move. And of course, when they spun around to see why everybody was fainting, they nearly went down themselves. Times are changing, you know, and people are gonna change with them. But the uh, San Quentin, you know, it ain't gonna change. It just ain't gonna change. No way. The only way they're gonna change San Quentin is when they flatten it to the ground. And that is a gospel truth. And you can say it over and over again because walls in San Quentin were built in hate. <laughs> they stand in hate. And there ain't a bit of love. And the world don't go around on hate alone. Because where there ain't no love, there ain't no understanding. And where there ain't no understanding, there ain't no compassion. And where there's no compassion, you got a prison. And that's San Quentin.
here is kind of cheap. 